welcome to Intrinsic Truth. This is Arthur. Our short study today has to do with the introduction to the book of Revelation. We will go through the entire book of Revelation, the 22 chapters in its entirety, verse by verse. However, today we will simply cover just the introduction to it. It is important for us to understand the issues surrounding the book, surrounding the believers of that time and surrounding John as well, and what we say about him and them today in modern scholarship. So those are important things for us to consider, to, under, to understand and to underline so that when we proceed to the rest of the book of Revelation, we'll understand the issues at hand. John simply introduces himself in the book of Revelation as John. He doesn't give us any other information about himself, which tells us that he must have been well known by the churches and, the church, and he knew the churches well himself. He writes to the seven churches in Asia, which is important for us to understand, church like Ephesus, for instance. So it's important for us to understand what he wrote to the Ephesians or what the Ephesians were like. We have a letter to the Ephesians, so we can understand this. We also have a letter to the Colossians. There was a church in Colossae that he writes to in the book of Revelation. So it's imperative for us to understand those letters and those audiences so that we can understand what John is writing and what purpose is he writing it for. The early church fathers, the Clement of Alexandria, Justin, Irenaeus, the Tertullian, believed that the author of Revelation was the same John who wrote the four Gospel of John, as well as the three letters. Today, modern scholarship does not agree with this theory the most, pointing out that the difference between the Gospel of John and Revelation are tremendous, especially when it comes to grammar and structure and syntax. And the style of writing is very different. Of course, the Greek is much more well polished in the Gospel of John than in Revelation. The question is, why would it be such a different language if the same person is writing it? Here they're suggesting he must have been a different author writing it. I believe there are really good reasons why the two Greeks in the Gospel of John and one in the Revelation of John are so different. One of the differences, primarily, is so that John, when he actually was writing the, the, the Gospel of John, the Gospel itself, he is using a scribe, he is using a secretary, which was a common practice at that time. Paul used secretaries, Peter used secretaries, Old Testament writers used secretaries. So John didn't have a chance to use a secretary while on Patmos, because he was obviously in exile. He was also a Palestinian Jew or Judean, which means that Greek was his second language. So relying on the secretary or the scribe to formulate his sentences and grammar would have been very useful, for which he would have had the time when he was writing the book of John, the Gospel of John, I mean. But when he's writing the book of Revelation, he's there on Patmos by himself, receiving that vision. He writes what he sees, but he doesn't have a chance to polish that language. So no doubt, the differences do exist. There are also many similarities between the two books, and I'll go through those similarities right now, so if you take a look at me on the screen, you will see the very same information. We have the Word of God being used as a title for Jesus Christ in John 1 verses 1 through 14. It is very clear. The entire prologue tells us that Jesus is the Word. It is the very same title that John uses in Revelation in chapter 19 for Christ as well. So Christ always functions as the Word, as the Word of God. Number two, Jesus named the Lamb in both books. It is true that he's named by Peter the Lamb of God as well. He is the third author that does, or the second author, the author that does this in the third book. However, what is interesting for us to note is that the Gospel of John as well as Revelation of John both name Jesus the very same title, the Lamb of God. Although in Revelation it is using a diminutive for the word lamb. Number three, quote from Zechariah 12, 10. Those who pierced him is only recorded in the book of John as well as Revelation of John. No other book in the New Testament mentions that quote from Zechariah 12, 10. We'll find out more about this quote when we actually get there. Number four, the, use, the usage of the strange verb to tabernacle, skineo. This is a very interesting and very strange verb because it actually does not exist in the Greek. John makes it into a verb which comes from the word uh, tabernacle or or tent. It's a noun, but he makes it into a verb and tells us that when Christ comes, 
He will dwell among us or in us. He actually means he will tabernacle within us. It is the same verb used once in the Gospel of John and several times in the book of Revelation. Both books are based on a testimony of Jesus Christ, which is important. The testimony is crucial. And both are based on this. You have the references there on the screen, which tells us the similarity in both books described about who Christ is. In fact, Revelation is really nothing else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, there's a slight difference between the Gospel of John and Revelation of John. The Gospel of John tells us about the first coming of Jesus Christ. Revelation, the second Gospel, so to speak, tells us about the second coming of Jesus Christ. John writes two Gospels, one about his first coming, the second about his second coming. That is really the difference in those two books because it is a revelation of Jesus Christ and we'll find out what that means in more detail. The one who thirsts is quite underlined in the Gospel of John as well as in Revelation. In the Synoptic Gospels when people come to Christ they hunger. In the Gospel of John as well as Revelation they come because they thirst. So the emphasis is placed on a water and human relationship not hunger and a human relationship. Number seven, the father and son relationship is heavily underlined in the Gospel of John as well as Revelation. Both books stress this idea greatly and that's because of the work of Christ and his reliance upon his father. The word thunder, bronte, which occurs nine times in the book of Revelation, occurs in the Gospel of John as well. When it thundered, people thought that God spoke. The only other author that actually uses the word to thunder or thunder is Mark when he says that these are the sons of thunder, once again referring to John himself. So it is interesting that John is the only author in the New Testament that uses this as a verb and says when it thundered God spoke and he does this both in the book of John as well as Revelation. And then lastly, the invitation to come and see, which is underlined in John as well as Revelation several times. It is important that the language remains the same, even though the grammar is different, the style is different, spelling is different, ideas and theology are the same, and even the verbiage remains the same, because John is the same author of these two books. The date of writing of the book of Revelation is somewhere between 81 to 96 according to scholars today I believe that it's somewhere around mid 80s <clears throat> when it comes to the 19 then when it comes to the 90s already we would most likely have the Gospel of John written probably around 95 96 AD so the the revelation of John somewhere 85 I would say according to tradition John lived in Ephesus before his exile to Patmos Thus, he must have been friends with the churches and maybe even their pastor. This is a quite possible situation, especially when he writes a letter to them and he wants to strengthen them in their faith. They are both going through persecution. He says that he's a fellow, the one who's being persecuted with them. They are fellowships in this struggle together. And so he writes to them to strengthen them so that they will believe in God. But why would he do this? Now, yes, he does this because they are being persecuted the churches are being persecuted. John is being persecuted on Patmos, but he also adds this, I believe, because of the struggles, internal and external, for the church at that time. The external problems was the participation in local pagan festivals, which we'll discuss a little bit later as well. What it simply meant is that there was a worship to foreign gods that was determined as necessary by the society. And if you did not take part in this, you would be chastised. People would not be buying from your store, for instance, or would not see you well on the streets. And they would want to say comments and things of that sort. So some church members felt that it was important for them to take part in it. This is why we have this struggle with the meat offered to idols. Is it okay for us to eat it or is it not? Is it okay to eat the meat and not take part in the festivals? Or should we go to the festivals and so that we are simply present, so people simply do not speak about us later on? Or do we even participate in some of the activities that they would have done? Those are issues that they would really have to consider. 
the persecution by the Judeans as well as persecution by the Romans. So these two issues were very, very great in the time of John, in the time of the New Testament churches, because these two groups persecuted the Christians heavily. And so we need to remember this and take this into account as the book of Revelation does. The internal problems, the first one is very similar, in fact identical to the first one in the external problems, which is participation in local pagan festivals. And here's a question of morality primarily. How far can we take part in those festivals? Can we really go to those temples and take part in the certain activities that they would have done? Well, if we do, we would have to then act immorally. And that's because of the worship to Asherah or Diana or Artemis. So those issues were very difficult for the church to solve. And so when John writes, he is not writing just to strengthen them in a time of persecution. He is also strengthening them in the faith in Jesus Christ so they will reject any human activity and focus on God himself. Then the food offered to idols, which you have sort of mentioned at first. There were a lot of food being offered to idols and then sold in markets. The question is, could Christians buy that meat? This is why Paul writes, don't even question. What gives, who gives you what? So simply eat it. If you are okay with it. If not, then don't do it. John answers that question as well for the Christians of his era. Immoral behavior accepted as norm. Now, this is very important that we've touched on this when it comes to the pagan festivals. This immoral behavior had to do with worship of Asher, which is a goddess of fertility. So that sexual intercourse would have been very prominent in those times, especially as an act of worship with the prostitutes from the temple. Temple prostitutes would go out or invite others to come and join in this festivity. The Christians were required to do the same. The question is, could we really do this in pure conscience, in pure faith to Christ? And of course we could not. And so here is the struggle of what to do and how far can we go to those activities. Can we simply go to the temple and observe as they do their thing or shall we not even go in? Shall we take the meat offered to them or not? And so this was a huge question for them. So we need to consider all those items as we go through the book of Revelation. Going forward to the uh, chiastic structure and the build of the book of Revelation, the entire book is built on a chiastic structure. This is one proposed, so I'll give that as a proposition. First we have the prologue, then we have the apologue and A primus respectively. Then we have the promise to the overcomer. Then B primus, we have the fulfillment of the promise to the overcomer. We can see how the layers do work. We have salvific work of God in C, and in C primus we have the finished salvific work of God. So we have the beginning, we have the end, we have the fulfillment in the beginning. D, God's wrath mixed with mercy, and in D prime is God's wrath unmixed with mercy. We'll discuss all those points in more detail as we go through those uh, points later on. John must prophesy again, it is told so to him in John chapter 10, and in E prime as the church proclaims the gospel at the end of time. We have the reflection of the preaching of the gospel first by John and then by the church. And in F, the very central point, the central theme of the entire book of Revelation is the conflict between Christ and Satan as it plays out through the centuries. And the book of Revelation simply tells us how this conflict is working out in the lives of the believers, in the lives of the church at present, which is symbolically stated as the sovereign churches of Revelation. We have a very similar parallelism between the prologue and the epilogue. The prologue and the parallelism, we'll just read the parallel words. Show his servants occurs in both. What must happen soon occurs in both. Jesus sends his angels. Blessed is he who holds. The words of this prophecy, the time is near. Then we have the seven churches and of course Christ. One more title, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There are four major schools of thought that we approach prophecies with, so I'll describe them very briefly today. The first I want us to consider is Futurism, which was discovered or developed by Francisco Rivera, who was a scholar, and Robert Bellarmine, which was a cardinal. Both were Jesuit priests in, uh, hired by the Pope as a counter-reformation answer. So, the reformers, if you remember, were saying that the Roman Catholic Church is the beast of Revelation 13. He is the little horn of, Revela of Daniel 7 and 8, as well as 11. 
And so they were pointing onto the Pope saying, this is the Antichrist, this is the great power that's working against. So here the Pope had a dilemma. Now they had to develop a different strategy, not just simply burn uh, unbelievers, so to speak, at the stake, those who disagree with them, they had to somehow confuse the masses, and so they've developed a theory called futurism, which most of the world, most of the Christian world today accepts. And this is why we look at what will happen in Israel, because futurism looks at fulfillment of prophecies only in relation to the physical and biological Israel. Futurism also developed this theory, which is called the gap theory or the church age, so that the prophet only sees to just a few years after Jesus Christ, and then he does not see anything else that happens for the rest of the 2,000 years, but just the seven years before Christ's second coming, which would then be Revelation 6 to the very end, or some even believe Revelation 4 to the very end. So the first three chapters of Revelation would have been fulfilled in 100 AD or by 100 AD. The rest will be fulfilled just before Christ's second coming. Either way you look at it, the Roman Catholic Church cannot be identified as the beast or the Antichrist of Revelation. Preterism does something very similar, developed by Louis de Alcaraz, which simply means that all the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation have been fulfilled by 100 AD. There's no more prophecies to look at, we just simply forget it. The third one is called idealism. This is a very modern or more modern ex approach to prophecies, which simply states that there is no historical relation of whatsoever and that all of those symbols are just an expression of God's love in a poetic format. So what we have is just God's love message to Christianity, but really nothing to do with prophecies and what will happen in the near future. Historicism, on the other hand, is a very systematic approach to prophecies telling us that everything we read in prophecy will have to be somehow marked in physical history. And this is what we look for. This is why when Daniel writes about the kingdoms, he tells us even what they are. So we, in turn, can now interpret all of those symbols and place them in historical moments, in historical time frames, and we follow linear history from the time of the prophet until the second coming of Jesus. This is what historicism is, and historicism approaches prophecies from that perspective, and it tells us where we are in history, and it tells us how God is leading His people through His love. I am not rejecting that God is presenting His love in prophecies, no doubt he is, but the approach to prophecy is not idealism, that's the, not the point of prophecy. The point of prophecy is to tell us what will happen and how God will protect his people. That's the point of prophecy. If we only focus on the protection of God or the love of God, we have forgotten the theological aspect and the historical aspect of prophecies that we must consider. With this, I would like to end today as the introduction for the book of Revelation. I invite you for our future studies on the book of Revelation. We'll go through the book of Revelation verse by verse and underline every detail, what we can and what we even cannot fully understand in that book. It is a marvelous book filled with God's love, no doubt, but yet filled with many wonderful blessings that if we read, we will be able to receive that blessing. Thank you again for your attention. This is Arthur for Intrinsic Truth. Have a great day.